Thank you. So our, our remote isn't working, so when you see my hand going up like this, it's not a tick. It's, yeah. I'm directing the slides to be advanced. Um, again, so I'm Michael Warner, and I'm the um, supervisor of the non-game and rare species program at Texas Parks and Wildlife. I used to be the invertebrate biologist, so I have this kind of carried forward interest in insects, particularly native bees. And so, when you, when you talk about bees, one of the biggest issues, one of the biggest services that bees as a group provide is pollination, a critical ecological service. 80% of the flowering plants worldwide depend upon animals for cross-pollination. These flowering plants produce showy structures, flowers of different shapes and colors and sizes to attract animals to them. And besides the showy structures, these plants also produce rewards in the form of nectar and pollen. Nectar is a liquid solution that contains sugars, amino acids, and other minerals. Pollen, which is involved in fertilization, is also a rich protein source for those animals that eat that. Um, most flowering plants are pollinated by insects, and insects just tend to be our most important agricultural pollinators. So in terms of pollination, you can kind of break it down into two different sectors. Agriculture, which is most important for humans. There are dozens upon dozens of different crops that require animal pollination for these crops to set fruit, produce viable seed, and so on. Oops, I'm sorry, could you go back? I'm too, being too, uh, <laughs> I gotta keep my hands. <laughs> I'm just my hands a lot. Just look at my left hand. Um, so agriculturally, if you're just talking about U.S. agriculture, the value of insect or animal pollinated crops, the U.S. economy ranges from 10 to $20 billion per year. Then, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, then you have natural systems. You have all those native flowering plants that are in the same boat. They either have to be pollinated by an animal to produce viable seed, or if they don't require it, they may produce higher quality seed. So again, you have all those dozen different uh, native plants out there. In turn, to entice seed dispersal, these, uh, many of those flowering plants produce berries and other fruit types that other animals eat. So you have mammals, birds, reptiles, other insects feeding on all this wild food. And so besides helping maintain the integrity of natural, natural ecosystems, it's also important for the food chain. It's hard to put a dollar figure on that, but if you think about from a human perspective, how much goes into hunting, bird watching, nature watching, that's probably easily in the hundreds of millions of dollars as well. So you've ever sit, sat and watched flowers in a garden or in a prairie, you've probably seen many different kinds of animals visiting flowers, and they're going there for food primarily. You have bees, you have flies, you have beetles, but I like to make the differentiation between a flower visitor and a pollinator because there are some animals that come to flowers, they drink the nectar, they may eat some pollen, but they don't pollinate it. They're visiting. They're taking the food, but they're not fulfilling the contract with the plant. Then you have pollinators that are actually in that mutualistic relationship where they're getting their reward and they're also effectively pollinating the plant. So beetles are real common flower visitors. They're not among the best pollinators. If you think about their bodies, their bodies tend to be hard and smooth, not many hairs, but beetles can pollinate. Then you have flies. Flies can actually be really important pollinators. They tend to be somewhat hairy and they can move pollen around. Wasps visit flowers to drink nectar. They're not among the top pollinators. Their bodies, again, are kind of smooth, virtually hairless. They don't move a lot of pollen. Butterflies and moths, those can be pretty effective pollinators in some cases, um, especially moths and those plants that are really adapted to moth pollination. But if you had all, took all those at least insect groups and, group, and kind of ranked them in terms of importance, Bees would kind of top out at, the, at number one. 
Uh, they tend to be the most efficient and effective pollinators for several reasons. One, they're among, of all those other groups, they're one of the few that purposefully collects pollen. So butterflies, uh, wasps, <laughs> flies, they're mainly there for nectar. They're not really, if they interact with pollen, it's incidental. Bees are purposefully collecting that pollen, mainly females, and they're taking that pollen back to the nest. A lot of it's going to be destroyed, eaten by their larvae. That's the larvae's main protein source. But um, bees are messy foragers, and they tend to spread that pollen around as they go from flower to flower to flower. Um, bees are also very hairy, and a lot of those hairs are specialized to carry lots of pollen. So if you looked at a bee up close, you can see they have lots of hair on their bodies, different places, on the legs, on the abdomen, on the thorax, and some of those hairs have little branches on them, which increases the surface area for carrying pollen. And so here's a leaf cutter bee that this leaf cutter bee females carry the <coughs> pollen and dips hairs under the abdomen, so it's carrying all those dry pollen grains. But again, you can imagine as that leaf cutter bee went from this flower to that flower, a lot of those pollen grains are going to get brushed off, get picked up by the plant. Then you have other bees, this is a bumblebee, they have very specialized structures. Bumblebees have this structure right here on the hind leg, it's their pollen basket. And as the bumblebee picks up pollen, it mixes it with saliva and nectar and packs it onto that hind leg. So bees, another reason they're really good pollinators is they have, some bees have this thing called floral constancy, which means that certain individuals, when they're out foraging, they'll tend to specialize on maybe a particular plant species. This is American basket flower. So in this case, with bumblebees, you may have bumblebees that are foraging individually that may only be working the flowers of American basket flower. That means that Pollen from this basket flower is going to make it, it has a high likelihood of making it to this individual and to that individual. So that pollen is not wasted on other species. You have other flower visitors, maybe like butterflies, that may be less, more random. They may go from basket flower to cone flower, and those are two incompatible pollen types. Um, but bees tend to have a certain fidelity for certain plants when they're foraging. So in terms of bees in North America, at least in terms of North America, north of Mexico, we have 4,000 native bee species, 30 bee species have been introduced into uh, North America, north of Mexico from other countries. Hard to know how many species are in Texas. A low estimate is 600, it could be up to 800, but we don't have that many people working on bee uh, distributions or bee taxonomy. We have probably have lots of species that have yet to be described. But when you talk about bees, you kind of have to dispel some of the notions that people have about bees. Because most people, when they think about bee, the word bee, they instantly think of the European honeybee, also known as the Western honeybee. Um, the social insect, you know, lives in a colony with a queen and all her daughter workers. Colonies can get really big, 10 to 50,000 workers in size. Colonies, queens can live for years. They can, the colony can persist for years. They provision mass amounts of honey as a backup food supply. New colonies form and swarming. Long relationship with humans. Honeybees have been in domestication for about 4,500 years. First developed by the um, first practice, first developed by the ancient Egyptians. Um, and, you know, when it's non, or it's non-native, like here, beekeepers are managing this animal pretty much as livestock. It's, I like this term, it's called a semi-free-ranging agricultural animal. That kind of takes it out of natural systems where it really doesn't belong. So again, native range of the European honeybee is Europe, down to Africa, a little bit of Western Asia. And you see all these different names here. These are different subspecies. So there, there are different subtypes of honeybees. Uh, honeybees were first brought to North America in the early 1600s. Mainly it was subspecies from Europe that were brought over. 
Then somebody or a group of folks wanted to get beekeeping going in Brazil, and they ultimately brought over this subspecies, Scutellata, <coughs> which is an African uh, honeybee subspecies. That interbred with European subspecies, produced the Africanized honeybee that then spread northward, made it to Texas in 1990. Um, you probably all heard lots in the media about honeybees declining, honeybees are disappearing, we're all going to starve. Um, there's a lot of hype about that. Um, this is a graph that shows the number of honey producing, number of managed honeybee colonies in the U.S. from back about 1945 based upon this annual USDA census. So the number of managed honeybee colonies in this country reached a high of about 5.9 million in 1947. Then you can see this steep decline. Well, there's a lot of factors that are contributing to that. A lot of them are economic and political. One is that after World War II, there was a real decline in demand for domestic honey. There was a lot of a lot of Asian imports were coming in that was driving down the price of honey in this country. So honey beekeepers got out of the business. Um, can Canada <coughs> banned the import of U.S. honeybee stock in the 1980s due to the fact that the Varroa mite, a pest, was introduced. Um, and then about the 1990s, there was a suspension of federal pricing support for honeybees. More people maybe got out of the business. This big uh, break that you see right there is the USDA changed their census methods. And so this may indicate that they were overestimating the number of honeybees. Um, but again, over the last 10, 15 years, the number of honeybee colonies in this country pretty much kind of stabilized around two, two and a half million. Yeah. But and also, honeybees have other issues that are real honeybee kind of specific things, and these have to do with the husbandry. There are introduced external parasites like varroa mites. There are diseases like deformed wing virus, American fowl brood, and lots of other issues like starvation, queen failure, extreme weather events. So all of those it makes it hard to be a beekeeper because honeybees are getting harder to keep. Um, but a lot of people don't think about, because kind of folks take honeybees for granted that they've always been here, but honeybees can have impacts on natural ecosystems. Honeybee, when it was introduced here, was like a really new kind of bee for the U.S. northward into Canada. There was no other bee like this. There was no native honeybee in the U.S. and Canada. Um, colonies, because they get so big, they require lots of food up to 22 to 132 pounds of pollen per year, 400, I'm sorry, 44 to 330 pounds of honey uh, per year, which is again nectar. Um, they have thousands of workers, which most of our bees don't have that. They have long flight distances. They can go up five miles away from the nest. And potential negative impacts on natural ecosystems are that they monopolize nectar and pollen resources, which can reduce or suppress native bees. It makes them harder makes it harder for the native bees to get the food they need. And honeybees have also been shown to increase the seed set of certain non-native invasive plants. I don't have the time to talk about sleeper weeds, but I can expand upon that later. And then reduce the seed set of certain na native plants. I'm not trying to assassinate the character of the honeybee, <laughs> because that 18, that 20 billion, that big figure that I mentioned for U.S. agriculture, three quarters or more of that agricultural pollination is done by the honeybee. It's our major primary agricultural pollinator. And also honeybees may increase the seed set of some native plants where there may not be sufficient natural uh, pollinators. So they may fill uh, pollination deficits. But I kind of, you know, some people often bring up they want to place honeybee colonies in prairies because I mean, it's, there's lots of flowers there, lots of food. However, honeybees really don't belong in systems that are managed for native biodiversity because they could, one, they could tinker with the plant composition and they may also reduce the native diversity of pollinators in an area. So native bees, 4,000 native bees in North America, North of Mexico, these tend to be the most important pollinators of native plants because they've been around those plants for hundreds of thousands of years. 
or millions of years. Um, better pollinators of some crops than the honeybee. Native bee pollination is valued at about three billion per year. Native bees tend to be better pollinators of things like tomatoes, squashes, uh, some melons, blueberries. They're kind of broken into three, uh, six groups. The aphidae contain the bumblebees, the carpenter bees, honeybees, longhorn bees, and a few other groups. Then you have the helictidae, which is a large group, includes the sweat bees, little wasp-like, green, bronzish, bronzish uh, metallic bees. Megacolidae are the carter, leaf cutter, mason, and resin bees. And then these three last groups are pretty small. The adrenidae, the mining bees, colletidae are the plasterers, and malinins are the little, kind of the smallest group. You know, they just, they call them malinins. <laughs> they don't get a special name. So I mentioned that the honeybee was a really new bee species from the U.S. and Canada. And that's because 90% of our native bees live solitary lives. So you have these individual females. They don't, have, they, they don't have any help from daughters or anybody else. They're on their own. They, they provision a nest. They set it up all by themselves. Now, because they do that, they don't defend their nest sites because the risk of injury or death is too great. If you think about a honeybee colony, the queen doesn't fly out to defend the nest. Her daughters go out. Her daughters are expendable. She can produce more daughters. She's the one that's important because she's laying the eggs. Um, don't defend their nest. Like when you're talking about bees and wasps in general, especially bees, males are only involved in mating. They don't help collect food. They're not involved in rearing young. Okay, of our solitary bees, 70% nest in the ground. You may come across aggregations like this that look like little ant hills, bees flying over that. That doesn't mean they're cooperating. That just means that may be good real estate. These native solitary bees that nest in the ground like open, not very vegetated areas that get lots of sun, that are well drained, easily diggable. Um, females will spend the night in their burrows. Here's a good example. This is in a black land prairie up near Paris, but this would be another kind of good example of native solitary bee nesting sites. These open, eroded areas that don't have much vegetation. So 70% of our solitary bees nest in the ground. The remaining 30% nest in <coughs> existing cavities in dead plant material, or they excavate their own cavities. So here's a leaf cutter bee. It's chewing a nest cavity into a giant cone flower. And then you have a carpenter bee here chewing into dead wood. Some bees don't have strong enough mandibles to chew into dead plant material. So they'll use pre-existing cavities like uh, old beetle holes, wood boring beetle uh, holes. And again, because they're solitary, these don't defend their nest sites. Example of habitat. Dead trees, that, uh, down wood, that sort of thing. So majority, vast majority of our native bees are solitary. We have a few though that are truly social. The best of the best known of those are the bumblebees. Uh, bumblebees are live a life cycle similar to honeybees in that you have a queen and all her daughter workers help do the work of the colony. Honeybee, uh, sorry, bumblebees don't store honey. They do, however, produce little honey pots or nectar pots, a lot of wax, where they store extra nectar uh, as a backup if it's cold or raining and they can't go out and forage. Hun uh, bumblebee queens only live one year. Honeybee queens live multiple years, so bumblebee colonies start up fresh every year. Bumblebees like to nest in holes in the ground, or they'll nest in deep thatch, particularly in, in prairies. They'll nest in deep thatch next to like clumps of big blue stem or little blue stem where the thatch has fallen over. Um, bumblebees are generalists in that they'll visit hundreds of different plants for nectar and pollen. And bumblebees are among the best, uh, most effective pollinators of milkweed. You know, milkweeds in fashion right now, you know, with all the news about monarchs and all that. Um, you probably can't see this, but there are a bunch of pollinia from the milkweed attached to that bumblebee's lick. So bumblebees, carpenter bees, big robust bees like that are really good pollinators of milkweed. 
Several bumblebee species in the U.S. and North America have experienced really steep declines. Um, there's one species, maybe more now, that have been petitioned for federal listing. And we have three species of conservation concern in Texas. So with native bees, native bees tend to be open habitat specialists. They don't like dark forests. They like areas like this, open, sunny, lots of herbaceous flowering plants, lots of open places to nest. And so this is a Gamble Goose Prairie up near Paris. Next to it is kind of a monoculture uh, grass uh, hayfield or uh, rangeland. And so most of that prairie now, most of that grassland is gone. And so this is a really good case study. Um, bumblebee declines worldwide were kind of first really noticed in the United Kingdom. And in Europe, 18 European species are now considered threatened. Um, evidence of North American decline was only really found about 2001, 2003, around there. Um, 11 species in, the North, in North America are, sparked, are thought to be of conservation concern. This is one, this is the American bumblebee. And so this is kind of a model, all the gray represents potential habitat or their potential range. And then the circles represents a survey that was conducted to revisit historic localities where bumblebees have been collected in the past. And so if it's yellow, that means they did not find the American bumblebee. If it's orange, that means they found it and what proportion of the bumblebees they collected the American, uh, American bumblebee uh, represented. So you can see historically uh, American bumblebees used to occur pretty much all across the eastern U.S. But in this study, they had, their range had contracted from the northeast pretty much to the central U.S., and they really remain only common along the Gulf Coast and into Texas. In fact, this is the most frequently observed bumblebee that you'll see in Texas. So, but this same pattern has occurred for several other bumblebee species. Besides habitat loss, there's also some concerns about introduced um, diseases that may be causing decline and maybe the impacts of pesticides. But in terms of bees in general and bees in Texas, this represents optimal habitat. Lots of different plants flowering, herbaceous plants, flowers that run from spring, summer, into fall, and especially um, so a lot of our native bees may have short activity periods as adults, like they may, like a mason bee may emerge in February and may only be active to May. They need flowers during that period. But you have bees like bumblebees <coughs> that are active and foraging from early spring all the way through summer and into fall. And so with the early spring, that's when the queens are emerging and they're looking to build up their strength after hibernation to start nests. And then once you get into summer, that's where the colony's growing. They need lots of access to flowers. And then towards the end of the season, that's when the new queens appear that are going to prepare to hibernate and they're building up their fat reserves. And so, especially now that <coughs> folks are thinking about monarchs and what we can do for monarchs, if it, one danger is getting fixated on monarchs coming through in the spring and then they're not here the rest of the summer and then they come back through the fall. And so some people may think, okay, we're going to do something in the spring, we're going to do something in the fall and that's going to help the monarchs. However, it, holistically, if you plan to have flowers through spring, summer, and fall, you're also help, you're helping the monarch, but you're also supporting the resident bees and butterflies and moths and beetles that live in that, that live, are here in Texas year round. So in terms of like managing grasslands, it all comes down pretty much to maintaining flowers and maintaining places to nest. And so to maintain robust populations, uh, of high quality nectar and pollen plants. Um, one thing is, is to not um, apply a management <coughs> practice to an entire site. So in terms of prescribed burning, um, 
only burn like 30 to 50 percent of a particular plot in a given year. So you burn half of it, let's say, the other half is left unburned. That maintains the nesting sites that were there where bees are hibernating. Um, and it also leaves, uh, yeah, so prescribed burning, burn from fall to spring, kind of outside of the growing season. That means you're not impacting the flower ne nesting sites. Um, avoid growing season burns and allow time between burns for thatch to accumulate because that, those sort of that thatch accumulation are going to be important sites for um, bumblebees to nest. Then in terms of like haying and mowing, again, the same sort of thing. Don't hay an entire field in one season if you can. Uh, restrict fall and winter. Don't cut when flowers are in bloom. Sometimes that's not, some folks aren't able to do that. So if you can't do that in the growing season, maybe cut in strips, leave some flowers available, avoid cutting too low, um, and don't cut more than once per year. Then grazing, low intensity, short duration during the dormant season tends to be the best, has the least impact on native pollinators. But again, for all of those, it's just treating a portion of a site, half of the site, 30%, and leaving some untreated refugia. Because we have 600 plus native bees in Texas, 4,000 in <coughs> North America, North of Mexico, they can be, sometimes they're hard to identify as a bee. They may look like a wasp or a fly. Um, but since we have technology, most people have smartphones. They can take pictures. Um, we have established a project through the website iNaturalist. How many folks have used iNaturalist? Okay. <laughs> so iNaturalist is a site where you can upload images of pretty much any kind of animal, plant, lichen, fungus that you see, and there's a community of folks that help to identify it. We have a project called Bees and Wasps of Texas, where folks can take images of the things that they see, upload it to iNaturalist. You can either do that on your desktop or your laptop, or there's an iNaturalist app. You can just take a picture and it uploads it to the site. Um, I just wanted to put a plug in for that because it's a really good resource for um, identifying not only bees and wasps, but lots of other animals and plants. Um, I know it was kind of fast because I was trying to get us, keep us on schedule, but I'm going to stop there and um, answer any questions you might have. Um, I have a housework question. Can the living um, about 100 miles north of here? And um, I just noticed that all my honeybees just went, they were gone um, about April or May. Um, I don't seem to have a lot of other bees. Um, I, you know, I, I brought my dogs out there and I, I just, you know, noticed all that stuff. I don't seem to have a lot of other bees to do, but um, what happens if I leave all my honeybees? Um, and I know you're not a honeybee person, but will the other, <laughs> well, you're a class. Do you keep honeybees or are these just ambient honeybees? I'm sorry? Uh, do you keep honeybees or are these no, just ambient? No, 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 they just all come to the hummingbird bees. Oh. Do you have any flowers around your house? I have a bunch of, a whole bunch of spiderwort. Um, yeah, it doesn't sound like there's many resources for native bees, because native bees really won't come to hummingbird feeders. Yeah, I mean, I love the, the regular the honeybee. Um, and I'm just wondering if the native bees, the folks out there, the honeybees um, left off, if, you know, if I've got vegetables, I'm trying to grow vegetables. Well, if there's not, flowers there, you know, it's there's got to be something to attract them. So you might want to, if you're like next year, you might, if like whatever vegetables you're growing, you might want to plant other flowering plants okay. that might be attractive. Yeah. And that way you're, you're enticing them to maybe also visit your vegetables. Yeah. Well, I'm getting some, I'm sending some native flowers, but and, and along with that, bee condos, which, which you need to do that for any of the Right, yeah. Bees. No, you can also, yeah, in terms of like, you're, you're, some of your native bees may be ones that nest in dead wood and they just don't have a place to nest. Oh, well, they've got so dead you, wood. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, is there 
there any scientific evidence, not that I don't buy this, but is there scientific evidence that a high diversity of native bees matters to pollination services? So for instance, is there a per do we know a percentage of plants that is dependent on native bees as pollinators? Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, you know, in terms, I guess I think of it this way. So majority of our flying plants have to have an animal pollinator. In general, the most effective natural pollinator, the animal pollinator is a bee. Um, there's a lot of redundancy in pollination. So you may have like 24 different animals visiting a particular flower and they all can pollinate it, maybe a beetle or a bee or a fly. Um, but that's why, that's why I mainly concentrate on native bees because that kind of boils it down because when folks think about, oh, I want to do something for butterflies, that's nice. But if you really want to have an ecological bang for your buck, native bees is kind of like, they're the workforce. They're like the primary pollinators. And so um, you have lots of native bees that are generalists. They may visit, like bumblebees, visit hundreds of different plants. But you may have a smaller percentage of your native plants that only depend upon a particular bee or a particular Small number. I don't know. If that's. I don't know if I answered the question. Um, but in terms of statistics, I'm not familiar. I'm have Einstein from Mercy. Hey, I don't have a specific stat, but I think that what you said is right on the money. That most flowers are pollinated by generalists. However, some flowers are going to be pollinated by specialists. For example, things like tomatoes. Um, honeybees are totally unable to pollinate tomatoes, and then there are other. Squash native bees are much more efficient. Typically, um, squash are 100% pollinated by native bees before the honeybees even left their hive in the morning. So there, um, there are some there are some flowers for sure and some vegetables for sure that your native bees are going to be more effective pollinators. But again, like Lucy was saying, generalists do the bulk of the work, and whether that generalist is a bumblebee or a honeybee. Less a question, more a comment. Uh, out on the Katy Prairie Conservancy lands in July of 14, I noticed a large number of, of Bombus pennsylvanicus, the American bumblebee. That's the good news. The bad news is we've got a lot of uh, Brazilian vervain, which is an invasive exotic, and they were all going to the Brazilian vervain to pollinate yeah. and yeah. to nectar. Yeah, yeah, that's the danger of a generalist. So yeah, so that may be a case where you have, and there are probably other cases of Native bees increasing the seed stat of non-native plants. So, yeah. We learned some years ago about the negative impact of DDT on insects and birds. Uh, as you look at sort of what's happening in the arena of pesticide production now, are there some that are that are considerable threats that we're seeing uh, that are that are quite potent with respect to the, the deleterious impact? Are, are you seeing some promising trends with respect to the design of pesticides that are less likely to have these harmful uh, side consequences? The ones that are in the biggest in the news, at least over the last five years, uh, are the neonicotinoids, which is a systemic pesticide that, you know, once it's on the plant, it kind of goes throughout it, can be expressed in the nectar and pollen. There are several different types of neonicotinoids, and they're used in agriculture, also used in home products, and there's been a lot of concern about the uh, direct mortality of things like bees and butterflies to neonicotinoids or maybe sublethal effects where they don't die, but they're impaired and they can't 
to function the way they want to. Um, I think did Europe ban the yeah. eviction noise for two years, two years. but yeah. yeah. So that's kind of come up with the EPA. There's a lot of research that kind of goes back one way or the other. Um, you know, certainly, and I think one of the biggest concerns is of the eviction noise with the home use, the home landscape use, because they tend to be overused in those settings. The less is the more is more sort of thing, where I'm going to really use a lot and it's going to kill a lot. Um, so yeah, neonicotinoids are still a big deal and still being looked at. No 